we've talked about our priorities and about the hopes we have for the future, but we have also to be real because the God we serve is a God of truth. And the truth is there are a whole range of obstacles that face the church, different in every place, but also as I and my diocesan colleagues, as we've been listening to you across the diocese, a number of these obstacles have emerged in common. We need to face them courageously. We need to face them knowing, as the Bible says, that the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. We need to get the spirit of Elisha, who said to his servants, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So we need to be hopeful and confident in God's strength. But also we need to be realistic about the obstacles that face us. And of all those obstacles, there are just uh, four or five that I'd like to share with you now. The first doesn't come as news to anyone. It's been the case really since almost the beginning or the middle of the last century. It is that we're going through one of those seasons in the life of the nation where the church is providing resource, but people don't seem to want us. Numbers are declining. The central place of the church in other eras and ages seems to have been shifted. We're on the edge and underneath, as I said in my inaugural sermon way back in 2014. What do we do about that? sense of decline well the first thing we do is to trust God and to ask the question Lord if this is the way things are as we look honestly at the world what do you want us to do how can we stop simply being a group of people who complain that things have changed how can we embrace the reality of the changed landscape of our church in such a way as to make a difference for the future that's something that demands from each one of us the capacity to encourage and to bring joy to one another, to point to examples of good practice and of good behaviour and to see what it is that God wants us to do now. We need to move, as the uh, title of a recent report on the racial profile of the church uh, says, we need to move more widely from lament to action as we look at the realities of the church's life. The second obstacle that over and over again we see around the diocese is that the people we have are tired. The pandemic has exhausted the whole nation. But for church people, it is tiring to be in leadership. The ordained and lay ministers of our church are tired. Church wardens are tired. Church council members are tired. Treasurers and secretaries sometimes are hard to find. The burdens of the legal church, which are so necessary in many ways, but in other ways too heavy, those burdens are crushing us. And we need to do what we can to simplify the structures of the church in such a way that we can do God's mission and not simply run our feet off to stand still. Both nationally in London and also here in the diocese, as far as we can legally, we're doing our best to simplify our processes, to simplify the structures, to make sure that we still have energy left to do the work of God after we have sustained the life of the church as it is. We're under-resourced on the front line. That's an obstacle, and we're reaching out to find help with that. The third obstacle that we've identified is that uh, right across the church, but also outside the church, there are high expectations on us. Sometimes those expectations now are unrealistic. When I wrote Fit for Mission in 2015, I talked about George Herbert, the great Anglican poet, who for four years was the vicar of a village near Salisbury with two curates, and the village had a few hundred people. 
We can't do ministry as George Herbert did now. We have to do things in a way that meets the expectations of people with the truth of who we are. And sometimes we have to bear the disappointment of people that we cannot be what they wish we could be. What matters to us, as the scripture says, is not what other people think of us, but what God thinks of us. And when we encourage and build one another up across the diocese as we pursue our purposes, I pray that we'll do so by not running one another down with unrealistic expectations, but by being real with one another about what we can do, about the huge bank of talent that there is in the diocese, and about the realistic possibility that we can make that bigger church with that bigger difference, using the people God has given us. Fourthly, we've recognised uh, the obstacle, and this is not news to anyone, that many of our buildings, which were built with such high hopes that the gospel could be proclaimed, have become burdens to us. Some of our buildings are spectacularly fit for purpose, or can be made so. In some places, they are the open door for mission. But we must be real and accept that in other places, the buildings, the church buildings we've inherited are millstones around the neck of the local church. We must be clear-sighted in working out what to do about that, recognising that so many people are deeply in love with the stones, with the bricks and mortar where they were baptised or married, where their loved ones had their funerals. And yet, day to day, some people's buildings are crushing them. What do we do in such a case? How do we encourage one another to be clear-sighted about what the church should look like as we go forward? We need to be grateful to God for the buildings we've received and the heritage we've received, but we need also to be clear that change may have to come. We need to do that together. Nothing will come down from the top. We need to listen to one another and to answer the question, what is it that God wants in our local situation with the resources he's given us? Not only the human resources, but the bricks and mortar that constitute the church building. Please face that obstacle with clear sight and high hope and help one another through. The final obstacle came to us from a consultation with our lay chairs. And the way they put it was like this. There's a challenge in joining churches that don't look or think or act like me. In other words, the diversity of our Church of England, which is such a glory, so many different ways of approaching the scripture, so many different ways of proclaiming the Lord, so many different ways of serving the world, that very diversity can produce an obstacle. I do things my way. I'm not that keen on the people down the road who do things another way, but they can if they like, as long as it doesn't bother me. As the old joke goes, you worship God your way, and I'll worship God his way. But friends, in the present day, we need to overcome this obstacle, not by ironing everything out into a, a, a bland uniformity, but by learning from one another and from our differences and by being prepared to work together with those who may disagree with us. Archbishop Justin frequently says we must in the Church of England find good disagreement, not only over the hot potatoes that face us in every generation, but in terms of our day-to-day -day cooperation. Can we work with those rascals down the street who do things differently? Maybe we can even learn from them. Certainly we may have things to teach them. Let's work together. Because if we don't hang together, friends, we will certainly all hang separately. And so my challenge to you and to myself is, can I work with the people who are different from me to produce an example for the whole world of what it can mean to be diverse and yet at the same time to serve others? and to worship God. Those are just some of the obstacles you yourself will identify others. But I wanted you to know that we recognize these. We're not afraid of them. 
but we don't want to ignore them either.